This morning, seven are coming forward to give testimony of God's grace in their lives through water baptism. Jesus said in Matthew 28, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What you're about to witness, water baptism, is an external symbol of an internal reality. Water baptism does not qualify anyone for heaven. It is a public proclamation that those being baptized are already qualified for heaven. Baptism does not forgive sins. It is a public proclamation that sins have been forgiven. On the basis of God's grace alone, in the gospel of Jesus Christ alone, procured by faith alone. These who are coming before you today are not here to tell you that they cleaned themselves up, got their lives right, started going to church, and are now therefore good. These are sinners, saved by God's grace. God saves sinners. And you're going to hear of God's love and the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, all on the basis of Jesus' death at the cross in the place of sinners. And how those are not just bare facts, but are life-transforming realities for all who would place their faith in him. So they're going to come up one by one. We're going to start with Jimmy Kelly. And Jimmy, would you come tell us about God's grace in your life? First Peter 1.14 says, As obedient children... Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who has called you uh, is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. I grew up in a loving Christian home filled with the gospel. My parents raised me and my three brothers well. We went to church and held biblical values, but for most of my life, I hid in the deceitfulness of sin and unrepentance. Up until high school, I hadn't come face to face with my own sin in a meaningful way until my eyes were miraculously opened to the message of the cross. It was only then that I began to understand what Christ's death, burial, and resurrection are really for. God demands perfection that no man can supply. And as I should have known, we are all sinners, even church-going Baptist kids like myself. I was a fairly well-behaved kid growing up. I stayed out of trouble and loved my parents. I valued their teaching and professed faith at a young age, but didn't have a saving knowledge of my need for a savior. When I started junior high, I had my first introduction to pornography. I was heavily influenced by the way my friends talked about women. Dangerous curiosity snowballed into a years long addiction. I kept my habitual sinning a secret, all the while telling myself I could just repent and be okay. I lived in ignorance of God's punishment, his just punishment, continuing to sin so that grace would abound. And during my sophomore year of high school, I got a job as a house painter for a man named Adam Knowles. Adam was a born again Christian who was radically changed by the gospel and had known Christ for only a few years. He found out most joy in his savior, even though he didn't have a lifetime of growing up in the church like I had. And it bothered me that he had something real while I clung to a lie. And my, my hypocrisy was more evident than ever. God planted a seed in my heart through the faithful testimony of his servant, Adam. In the summer before my junior year of high school, my brother Andrew, who I hope is watching, <laughs> enlisted me to volunteer at a Christian outreach concert. I was told to collect connection cards for people responding to an altar call. But I couldn't bear the weight of helping other people find truth in Jesus while I knew that I needed him more than anything. Before the band played their last song, the lead singer told a story about a man who committed a great crime and was sent to prison for a very long time. And when he was approaching the time of his release, he wrote a letter to his wife. It said, 
I know I've been gone for a long time, and I'll understand if you don't want me. When I get on the Greyhound bus to come home in a few weeks, put out a yellow ribbon on the tree in the front yard if you still want me around. But if it's not there when I drive by, I'll just keep on going. A few weeks later, when he rounded the big turn before his home, he looked out of his window and saw a thousand yellow ribbons on that tree in the yard. And he could go home. The thing that struck me more than anything at that moment was the immeasurable amount of God's grace. I confessed my entire heart to my brother on the spot. And in that moment, I realized that God demands holiness, but we are in desperate need of salvation from our wickedness. I had transgressed against a holy God and needed atonement for my sin. Through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, my sin was atoned for, and I had access to this life through faith in Christ. God's grace was bountiful for me, a dead sinner by faith alone. And hiding from my sin was death to me, but God sought me out. Hebrews 13, 12 to 13 says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God, but exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Since the day of my repentance, God has continued to sharpen me by bountiful, faithful teaching and godly men like Adam Knowles. And most recently, I've had the privilege of sitting under the teaching of the men of Grace Bible Church by not forsaking the gathering of the saints and by being involved and build in my small group. I am here to be baptized because I was once dead and I'm alive again. I was lost and I'm now found. Doug McComb, would you come boast in your Savior? <clears throat> My name is Doug McComb. I was saved at a very early age, probably around eight years old or so. God blessed me, and I grew up in a Christian home and was very fortunate to have been raised. <clears throat> in a very sound biblical church in California for 20 years. Interestingly enough, it was called Grace Bible Church. While I was taught from a very early age that we were sinners and were saved by Jesus' shed blood, while I was not saved from a life of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, one thing be became very clear as I grew up. In Proverbs 16, 9, it says, the mind of a man plans his ways. <clears throat> but the Lord directs his path. God has blessed me in spite of myself, not because I made great choices. <clears throat> the Lord blessed me with four kids, which of course, four kids became four teenagers. Through the teenage years, my knees knew the ground very well. Fortunately, the Lord was there to pick me up when I couldn't get up anymore. In Deuteronomy 31.6, he says in his word, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. As I look back on some things that 50 years later, I am so grateful that God answered his prayer. I'm so grateful that God answered prayer his way and not mine. I love the book of Ecclesiastes, written by King Solomon, 
written by the man who pretty much had anything he wanted. In Ecclesiastes 7.20, it is written, Indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and never sins. Ecclesiastes 12.13.14 The conclusion, when all has been heard, is Fear God, keep his commandments, because this applies to every person, for God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether good or evil. Even King Solomon knew judgment would come. Fortunately, I have a Savior who died for me. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10 tells us, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for his good work, which God prepared beforehand that we would walk with him. For 60 plus years, I, the Lord has been leading me. The Lord has been very forgiving and more than gracious to me. I know I am not worthy of his love, and at times I'm not faithful. In Revelations chapter 3, verses 14 through 22, John is writing to the church at Laodicea in the end times. In Revelations 3, 15 and 16, he says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. That is nothing I wish to be said about me when I die, <laughs> which is why I'm being baptized today. I know that water baptism is not going to make a difference whether or not I go to heaven. In Galatians 7, excuse me, in Galatians 3, 26 and 27, for you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you who are baptized into Christ and close yourself in Christ. I am more than willing and happy give a testimony to the world of my salvation. <clears throat> I don't want anyone to doubt where I stand on being one of God's children. In today's cancel culture, should it become unlawful that you should not worship Jesus Christ, read the Bible, witness to anyone about the redemptive work of our Lord, meet together as a believing body, show someone the good news from the Bible, or take someone down the Romans road. I want to make sure that there is more than enough evidence to convict me of that crime. In Luke 12:8, in he says, And I say to you, everyone who confesses me before men, the Son of Man will confess him also before the angels of God. In Matthew 10:32, he says, Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will confess him before my Father who is in heaven. This is the story of my life I want the Lord to remember. Now that, <clears throat> not that I was afraid to give a testimony in Luke 12, 19. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. In Joshua 24, 15, Joshua asked the children of Israel whom they will serve. <clears throat> if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose yourself today who you will serve. What are the gods which your fathers served, which is beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living? I want my answer to be the same as Joshua's. But as for me and my house, we will follow the Lord. That based on your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And Judy McComb, would you follow your husband's lead and boast in your Savior? Hi, uh, my name is Judy McComb. Uh, I'm thankful to be here today and be given this opportunity to talk to all of you. Uh, some of you know me very well and some of you really don't know much about me. 
I'd like to tell you what I think is the most significant thing about me, which turns out to be more about the most significant truth about our Creator God. I grew up in Southern California with my dad and mom and two older sisters and two younger brothers. We all went together to a church that was diligent to teach us the Bible, God's Word. I also remember lots of music at that little church, and I love music. But the most important thing I remember and am thankful for is how we were taught from the Bible. My parents and friends and family at that church taught me the gospel or the good news that God loves me so much that he sent his son to pay the penalty in my place for sins that I committed. 1 John 4.10 says, In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, which just means the substitute that satisfies for our sins. This is the good news, uh, God sending his substitute to pay the penalty for my guilt. I learned that I could never be able to be in the presence of holy God because of the sinful condition in my heart and life. I memorized lots of Bible verses as I grew up. Um, these verses in the book of Romans helped me understand why I need the Savior who paid my penalty. Romans 3, 10 through 12 says, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that seek after God. Romans 3, 23 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23 says, The wages or the penalty of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. I could understand that these verses from God's word described me. I was always trying to do good and be good, but I was coming up short. My brothers and sisters always called me the goody good because I always tried to do the right thing or the good thing, uh, but I knew I was not really so good inside. I knew that, I knew and God knew the sin that was in my heart. I could hide it from others, but not from God. When you grow up in this kind of Bible teaching church, it's easy to just keep telling yourself these gospel facts that Jesus Christ died on the cross in my place to pay the penalty for my sin, so don't worry about it. Uh, Romans 5, 6 says, when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Romans 5.8 says that God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. One summer during my high school years when I was at church camp, I was talking with my cabin counselor, Charlotte, who was from our church. She knew me very well and asked me if I had ever asked God to forgive my sin and change my heart so that he could be my personal Savior and Lord. I prayed along with her that night and simply asked God to rescue me from my hopeless, feeble attempts to be good on my own. I humbly asked God to be my Lord and give me a new heart that could follow him. It was so simple, and I knew that God had changed me just because I asked in faith, trusting him. That was many years ago, and I have been in God's loving grace ever since. I love that word grace. Grace is unearned favor, unearned and undeserved. It's not a feeling, but a fact. I married a wonderful man <laughs> uh, who has also been transformed by the saving grace of Jesus. We raised four children who are now adults, uh, they have expanded our family with their spouses and six very cherished grandchildren. I love being their mom and grandma. It's, not easy, it's no easy task to raise children, and there were some challenging circumstances along the journey. Jesus has lovingly allowed tough circumstances in these many years, always for a purpose, to help me see my continued need of him and his unfailing provision for me. This is what is significant about my life. This is the significant truth about our Creator God. 1 John 4.10, in this is love, not that we loved God, 
but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the substitute that satisfies for our sins. Romans 1.16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone that believes. This same gospel good news that I learned and believe is for everyone. 1 Timothy 1.15 says, this is a completely truthful and faithful statement and worthy to be fully accepted that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am foremost of all. I'm here today to share this good news with anyone who will listen because it is life-saving information that everyone should hear. Maybe you've heard it before, maybe this is the first time you've heard it, Maybe this is the day that you can see your own need for Jesus who died in your place. If you want to have Jesus give you a new heart and fill you with his everlasting love, it's really simple. Just talk to God in prayer and he's always listening. Proverbs 8:17 says, I love them that love me and those who seek me early will find me. I would love to pray with you or talk with you more about this if you would like to do that. Uh, because I think it's the most important thing that you would ever do. privilege based on your profession of faith in Jesus Christ to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Autumn Lizer, come tell us about God's grace in your life. My name is Autumn Lizer. The Lord has been so gracious and merciful toward me and it is a pr pleasure and privilege to speak about how he has done a great work in me to glorify him. Growing up in church, I thought I had to do good works to obtain righteousness in God's favor. Between Sunday services and Bible studies, I would fail, feel guilty, and recommit my life at each altar call and had been baptized multiple times. Eventually, having had enough of the, selfish, the self-righteous works-based living, I rejected church and the family values I was taught. I ran away from home to embrace the world and its wickedness. Ultimately, one night, something went horribly wrong, but in retrospect, I can look back and see God's sovereign hand in the situation and thank him for using that bad situation to draw me to him. I asked God for help, and in his grace, he began the path for me to be reconciled. Being at that lowest point, I felt just as empty and void as trying to appear righteous on my own. No matter which choice I made between the two, being either a self-righteous self hypocrite or a pagan lover of self, they both are destructive lies to embrace, leaving the soul dead and barren of which cannot stand to the truth of salvation. <laughs> These verses are meaningful to me, specifically reflecting on that night. I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my supplication, because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I shall call upon him as long as I live. The cords of death encompassed me, and the terrors of Sheol came upon me. I found distress and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I beseech you, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is compassionate. The Lord preserves the simple. 
I was brought low and he saved me. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. It's from Psalms 116, one through seven. In time, God mended and healed my mind. I attended a church and there the Lord gave me understanding of the gospel. I believe what scripture says, that none are good, and the righteousness of man is like filthy rags before the Lord. I know that God sent his beloved son, Jesus, to live the perfect life I cannot, and he incurred the wrath that was meant for me, that whoever would repent and put their trust in Christ would be saved from the just wrath we deserve. I understand it is not by works, but by the gift of grace through faith in Jesus Christ. The Lord saved me, a woman dead in her sins, by his perfect work and ultimate sacrifice and his love for me. Jesus, who rose from the grave by this power, made me alive in him. Though I was saved years ago, I was actually baptized before I was saved. So in speaking with the elders about my testimony and wanting to be obedient to God's word, I am here today joyfully being baptized after being saved. privilege based on your testimony of faith in Jesus Christ to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Maria Hornack, come tell us what God has done for you. My name is Maria Hornack. I'm here this morning to be baptized because I would love to make a public demonstration that I died with Jesus, was buried with him, and then I have been raised to a new life. Romans 6, 4 says, we were therefore buried with him through baptism to death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Around 2000, my husband Robert was born again. About a year later, I made a profession of faith, but I now know that it was a false faith. I didn't have the same passion and desire as Robert did. I didn't have the true understanding of who God is and what he wanted from me. I heard the gospel countless times, but I was not convicted. For many years, I lived as a false convert. In 2015, we moved to Arizona from California and made Grace Bible Church as our new church home. I was desiring God and his word less and less. On Sunday mornings, I would often only pretend to listen to the sermons as my mind would focus on other things. I stopped listening to sermons podcasts during the week, and I also stopped reading my Bible. As time went by, my thoughts became more and more worldly. In May of 2020, Robert became aware of a sinful life that I was hiding from everyone. I finally admitted that I had been living a lie for many years. That day, Robert and I met with Matt Kelso for counseling, and eventually Denny and Barbara Pagel started meeting with us. Barbara gave me several Bible passages to read and focus on. I read Psalm 51 and 1 John, and among other passages. Robert also played a recording of Jonathan Edwards' sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, for me. In late July 2020, 
after lots of prayer and godly counseling. I confessed my sin as God opened my eyes and softened my heart. I understood that I was a sinner who deserves God's judgment. Jesus died in my place in order to pay for my sins and came back from the dead. And I am now trusting in Jesus' sacrifice and nothing else for my salvation. I turned away from my sins and placed all my faith and trust in Jesus because he loved me and saved me. Christ is giving me a new heart with new desires and a new life, and I can rest in that. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is in a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. As a result of God's grace, my life is very different now. I shepherd my heart daily with the gospel. My relationship with Robert and Rachel is stronger than ever. And I would love to thank them for counseling, or I'm sorry, for continuing to support me through my walk in the Lord. But most of all, all the glory goes to God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who through his word and by the power of the Spirit showed me how ugly my sin was and revealed his righteousness to me. He gave me mercy instead of wrath. And God proved his perfect love for me by taking on the punishment that I deserve and that makes him worth trusting. I would love to leave you with one more Bible verse, Romans 5, 8, but God showed his love for us that in that, in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you. <laughs> based on your profession of faith in Jesus Christ to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Greg Bender, would you come boast in your Savior? Uh, hello, my name is Greg Bender. Um, in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Jesus tells his disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> this is a direct command from Jesus for this public display of identifying with him. In Acts chapter 2, Peter had just finished preaching the gospel to a group of people. After hearing this, the people were broken by their sin. Verse 37 says they were pierced of their heart. They asked Peter and the rest of the apostles, what shall we do now? Peter replied in verse 38, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the, for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There were 3,000 people that day who received his word and were baptized in public. I am here today broken by my sin against a good and holy God, who deserves my praise and adoration to be obedient to his command, to be baptized following the example of those first 3,000 converts and Christ himself who was baptized by John the Baptist and proclaim him to be my Lord and Savior. I was born into a Catholic family and baptized around the age of four weeks. Growing up, our family attended church every Sunday. <clears throat> I attended Catholic school in my early years and public school later on. I took catechism classes, was an altar boy, and completed the sacraments of confession, reconciliation, holy communion, and confirmation. I was taught and truly believed that Jesus was the Son of God who became man, was crucified, died and buried, then rose from the dead for my sake to forgive me of my sins. I thought I was a pretty good kid most of the time, and after all, I was covered by those sacraments I had completed. Now all I needed to do was to be a good person and try not to commit any sins. But if I did, then Saturday night confession and penance would cover me for another week. Even as a kid, it didn't take me long to figure out <clears throat> that I could commit as many sins as I wanted from Sunday after church until Saturday night confession. 
After confession and penance, I only had to be sinless for about 16 hours before I could participate in Holy Communion. And then I couldn't even do that. I would find myself fighting with my sister on the car ride home from confession because I wanted to sit in the front seat. <clears throat> then the next morning, while still steaming at her, I would take communion anyway. When I was 15, we moved here from Ohio. That move created some tension in the family, and Sunday church attendance became less and less frequent. Eventually, I stopped attending. I met Cindy in high school, and we eloped soon after we graduated. Two years later, we started a family, and over the next seven years, our three lovely daughters, Amy, Jody, and Mindy, were born. As we were raising our girls, Cindy began asking me about going to church and about Catholicism. I was stumped and couldn't tell her much. My parents were attending a Catholic church nearby, and we decided to start attending there. Cindy and the girls were baptized. We received the sacrament of marriage in the church, and then I found myself back in the old ritual of my earlier years, going to church, still sinning, still going to confession, but starting to think confession wasn't even necessary. <clears throat> Eventually, our, our church attendance lessened until finally we just stopped going. I was not the spiritual leader God calls husbands and fathers to be. Fast forward to 2007, 2008. Cindy's sister and husband, Janice and Bob, gave us a study Bible and invited us to go with them to their Bible church. Having not been encouraged to read or study God's word when I was growing up, my first thought when I saw the Bible was, this is really nice, but what am I going to do with it? Cindy was enthusiastic to attend church with Janice and Bob, but I was reluctant and suggested if we were going to start going to church again, we should find a Catholic church. She agreed, and we tried a couple of Catholic churches, but didn't like them. I finally decided to give Janice and Bob's church a try. That day, I heard God's word preached for the very first time in my life. It was absolutely amazing, but it wasn't enough to weaken the want of stained glass windows, prayer candles, statues of Mary and the saints, and the vestments worn by the priests that I had grown so accustomed to. We tried a few other Catholic churches, and occasionally we would go with Janice and Bob to their church. The more often we went to the Bible church, the more I started to desire hearing God's word taught, and the ornamentation that I was so accustomed to became less important. Finally, Cindy and I made the decision to faithfully attend the Bible church, and we became members. At that time, I was encouraged to join a group of men who met early Tuesday mornings for a Bible study at a coffee shop near our home. One morning, the conversation turned to the topic of the head pastor being a five-point Calvinist. I didn't know what that meant, and I didn't ask, but I did go to the church bookstore, and I asked if they had any books on Calvinism. I purchased the five points of Calvinism and began reading. Not agreeing with what I was reading, I set the book aside. Yes, I understand that I am a sinner, but total depravity? The author was trying to convince me that I am totally depraved, natural-born sinner, and quoted these verses among others. Romans 3, 10 through 12, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside together. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Psalm 58, 3. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray from birth, speaking lies. Genesis 6, 5. The Lord saw that wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. I recall thinking that these verses did not apply to me. They told me I was in bondage to my sin. I was without the ability to change myself. But yet, for years, I had been reading motivational speakers, and they said I could change. And besides, I am a good person. Then I thought, I was 50 years old, I actually thought this, maybe I should keep a running total of the good and bad things about me. When I present the list to God at the gates of heaven, he will see that I am a good person, and he will have no choice but to let me in. Then I read this thing about election. The verses in the book seem endless. Psalm 33:12 states, The people whom he has chosen, Haggai 2:23, For I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. Matthew 22:14, For many are called, but few are chosen. Now the author is telling me I have nothing to do with my salvation, that my good and bad list is worthless. 
I had enough and I shelved the book, but for some reason I kept wanting to pull the book from the shelf and start reading again. I didn't realize then, but now believe it was God's irresistible grace gently tugging and pulling me towards him. I started reading again from the beginning, T for total depravity, and still not convinced, I had this aha moment. I remembered that the author of the Five Points of Calvinism book I was reading was a man, not God. I didn't know the Bible well enough to discern if he was accurately quoting scripture. And I did have the belief that the Bible is written by God and is true. So my plan was to check every verse quoted in the book against the Bible and put this nonsense to an end. I was not prepared for what I discovered. The first book I read, the first verse I checked, the wicked are estranged from the womb, they go astray from birth speaking lies. And there it was right in the psalm. It was God's word. And then I thought, this isn't going to go well. <laughs> and it didn't. <laughs> well, I mean, it did. <clears throat> I started thinking about that verse and wondered, who teaches their two-year-old child to grab a toy from another child and scream mine or bite or throw temper tantrums? Nobody that I know does this, so where does that come from? That's total depravity. That's a natural-born sinner. As I slowly worked my way through the book, comparing verses with the Bible, God started revealing to me my true nature. I am a natural-born sinner. I don't have the ability to save myself. My will is not free. It is in bondage to sin and Satan. My best days are like filthy rags compared to God's righteousness. Did I choose God or did he choose me? God convicted me of the worldly things that I had pursued and treasured and put before him. He was always last on that list if he was even on it at all. Anytime I thought about God, it was not me. It was God reminding me that he was still there and using his effectual call of the Holy Spirit to work on my heart and call me to him. He reminded me that even though I lived in sin and ignored him, he poured his wrath out on his own son, Jesus Christ, so that I may be redeemed, Galatians 3.13 so that our sins are forgiven, Ephesians 1, 7, so that I was freed from the slavery of sin, Romans 6, 14, and so that I will be righteous before God. I did not discover these truths on my own. God revealed them to me in his own time and in his own way. It is his mercy and grace that saved me. I was humbly brought to my knees in confession, repentance, praise, and gratitude for this undeserving gift. I am ready and excited to be baptized, declare my independence, or declare my dependence on Jesus Christ and proclaim him to be my Lord and Savior. Greg, it is my privilege to baptize you based on your profession of faith in Jesus Christ in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And Cindy Bender, would you come boast in the grace of God and the gospel? Hi, I'm Cindy Bender. I'm here to be baptized because I love the Lord and I want to be obedient to his commands. I have had my sins washed away by Jesus Christ and I want to publicly proclaim that he's my savior. In Acts chapter two, verse 38, Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God is holy, and I was separated from him because of my sinful behavior. In my pride, I thought I was a good person. 
I'd always tried to follow the rules, and because of that, I had a hard time recognizing my sin. It wasn't until I immersed myself in God's word that I saw the truth that I had been deceiving myself. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, I learned, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. In contemplating why I wanted to be baptized and studying the scriptures about baptism, I can clearly see that it is commanded. So I've been asking myself, why did I overlook that before? When I was in my 20s, I was baptized in a works-based, sacraments-based religion. And over the years, my eyes were opened to the many errors in that system, and praise God, I fell away from those false teachings. I understand now the precious gift of God's grace and how I am saved through the belief in his Son, my Savior, Jesus Christ alone, not from any good works I do or sacraments I participate in. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. I didn't hear the true gospel until 2007 when my sister Janice invited us to her church, which was a true Bible-based expository teaching church. In 2008, I started attending an inductive Bible study course on Ephesians through their women's ministry program. It was through Ephesians that I learned how merciful God is and the redemption we have in Christ alone. Ephesians chapter 2, 4 and 5. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. I think in those early years of my conversion, I was so overwhelmed with the blessings and benefits of being saved by grace that I didn't grasp the depth of my sin. I was still stuck in the I'm a good person mindset. Yet I did begin to wonder if my good behavior was God's common grace to those around me, not something that I was intentionally doing to bring glory to God. Was I trying to be approved by the world were my actions motivated out of pride and the sinful desires in my heart rather than from a humble and contrite spirit? In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, I learned, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Through God's kindness, I began to crave his word, and I was convicted almost daily of my sins. Sometimes I still am. I want to be baptized because I want to be obedient to our Lord's command to repent and be baptized, but also because I realize in not doing so, this is an area of disobedience in my life. That statement seems so obvious to me now, but for many years I hadn't recognized sin, my sin in this area, nor had I realized that it grew into disobedience in other areas of my Christian walk, such as my fear or reluctance well, truly, it's my sin of disobedience or avoidance in um, sharing the gospel with unsaved family, friends, and strangers. Romans chapter 19, verses 14 and 17. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. In all honesty, there are still many sins I'm convicted of and must repent from daily. Things I never would have recognized as sin before the Holy Spirit and God's word began searching my heart and bringing me to confession and repentance and transforming my life. Things like, am I angry? Do I speak before I listen? James chapter one, verses 19 and 20. My brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteousness that God desires. 
Am I anxious or fearful? Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. Joshua chapter 1, verse 19. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Do I trust in God's sovereignty, even in financial matters? Matthew chapter 6, verses 26 through 33. Oh, you of little faith, your heavenly Father knows what you need. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Do I gossip? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 16. Avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Through his word, I now see my sin for the wretchedness it truly is, and I understand that my sin must be punished. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isaiah chapter 53, verse six. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. God's love for us, his gift, his perfect plan to save us, is through the death of his perfect son, Jesus Christ. Romans chapter five, verse eight. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his, own, his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I am overwhelmed by that truth. I can have a relationship with God now and in the future because Christ paid the price for my sins, dying in my place to reconcile me with the Father. My Savior Jesus, the sinless one, died for me, a sinner, and I have been saved from God's wrath. That's great news. Romans 8, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. And John 3, 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. I believe in Jesus' death and resurrection for my, my redemption and forgiveness of my sins. So I've asked myself, Acts chapter 22, verse 16. Why do you delay? Get up and be baptized. I love my Savior. He is precious to me, and I want to be baptized today. Indeed, it is my privilege to baptize you based on your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> 